Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Listen, people have asked, why would God allow the coming one world order? Well, the thing is, if you've never read the entire Bible from cover to cover, you probably wouldn't understand. But if you read in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve were disobedient, and God allowed the disobedience, but the thing is, they suffered the consequences of disobedience. You know, he, the, the Lord God always gives you instructions to protect us, just like a mother and a father tells a young child, always look both ways before you cross that street so a car doesn't hit you. Well, same thing. Of course, the devils that run the world and, their, and the media will tell you, well, you know, just like in Genesis 3, the serpent, which was really the devil and Satan, will tell you, oh, well, God's trying to hold you back. I'm trying to give you his secret knowledge. Well, that's a lie. So God allowed Adam and Eve to disobey, but there were consequences. And then God took Israel out of captivity in Egypt and offered to be their king and fight their wars for them. Do you know there were times when uh, the, the Israel was fighting the Canaanite tribes and God actually threw down stones from heaven to wipe out their army? And you know, all the miracles that he showed them in, in Egypt, uh, which the plagues of Egypt parallel the plagues of Revelation. I mean, it, in a lot of ways, not completely. I don't understand why. I know there's some very similar, uh, strong similarities. But then in the book of First Samuel chapter 8, the people said, oh, well, we don't want God as our king. We, we want a human earthly king. And in verse uh, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. In other words, go ahead and listen to what they're saying. Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee. But they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And we're not talking about raindrops falling from the sky. We're talking about ruling and reigning, uh, being a king. Now, when you read Job chapter 1, now the thing is, Satan went to God and said, put a challenge before him. And told him, well, yeah, of course Job, uh, you know, follows you. You've, you've protected him. And basically, he's, Satan issues a challenge and says, you know what? You let me touch all that he has. And Job will curse you to your face, God. And, uh, of course, God said, well, okay, let's, let's, I'll, I'll take up your, uh, your little bet here. Uh, that's the Bob translation, but uh, he was not. Satan was not allowed to touch his life. And if you were interested, you could read the rest of the story. So, why is God going to allow the new world order? Well, we've been disobedient. We have failed to honor God the Father and Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, and. We haven't followed his ways and his laws. So my opinion is, hey, you guys don't want me for a ruler? No problem. I'm going to let you have Satan for your ruler. The beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Let's see how you like it. And the ultimate conclusion is going to be, will you worship the beast? Will you take his mark? All right, well, that's, this is the introduction. Please continue listening 
and you can hear why God allows the New World Order. This is going to be part two or the conclusion of why God is going to allow the New World Order or the coming kingdom of the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Um, I mentioned in the update I'm moving locally and uh, I'm going to probably be offline for a while. This is not going to be a detailed Bible study. Um, I'm just going to give you an overview. But, you know, a lot of people wonder why God allows Satan to exist. Well, in a nutshell, it's to test us. I mean, when you read the book of Job, the first chapter of the book of Job, um, I mean, Job tested. Job was tested by Satan. And the thing is, I guess you could say this is sort of like our, uh, life is sort of like our final exam. Some are going to pass, some are going to fail. It's going to be interesting that um, a lot of people that went to church who never bothered to pick up their Bibles are going to realize just how wrong they were about some things. You see, wrong theology, wrong doctrines can be fatal. For example, Harold Camping. He's a guy who kept predicting the end of the world, but, you know, he wasn't the only, only one. The Campbellites, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, a bunch of others, a bunch of people all predicted, you know, date setters. Well, you know, um, the apostles asked Jesus when he was going to be coming. And he told them when he was a, uh, in human form on the earth, he didn't even know. So let's take a look at that. All right, let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is uh, should be read in conjunction with the book of Revelation. Verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Guess what? If the Wailing Wall was part of the temple, like the Jews say, Jesus is a liar. Or the Jews are wrong and the Wailing Wall is not part of the temple because Jesus said there would not be one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3. And as, this, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking him, uh, what are, what's going to be the signs of your coming, and, and what about the end of the world, you know? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. In other words, pay attention. Don't be tricked. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay? And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars, and see that ye are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Read in Revelation. This is, this is coming, people. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Wait a minute. Didn't, didn't, isn't TBN and Benny Hinn always say, hey, send us a tithe, and you're going to be blessed, and be wealthy, and everybody's going to love you, and wait a minute. Was the Bible mistranslated, or is Benny Hinn right? Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, 
and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. That's right. When persecution comes, people will turn against the true believers. They will betray the true believers to save their own hides. And they shall hate true believers. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity, wickedness, sin... And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Isn't that happening now? I never, never thought I would see the day when sodomites would be legally allowed to do a state union that they call a marriage. Never thought I would ever see that. Listen to this. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What do you mean you, we got to endure unto the end? The same shall be saved. Well, that's the words of Jesus. Don't argue with me. Uh, let's see. Let's skip down. Uh, let's see. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. Tribulations trouble people. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Christ warns you. There's going to be false Christ, false prophets. They're going to show signs and wonders, miracles, that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Those people that are too stinking lazy to read the Bible, they're going to be deceived. Trust me. Trust me, they will be. Verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See, when Christ comes, it's going to be like lightning coming out of the east and shining even unto the west. For what? Wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Ooh. Skip to verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Even Jesus didn't know what day he was going to come back. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so, you know, let me tell you what. 
It's going to be a time of great wickedness. A lot of false Christ, false prophets. They're going to show signs and wonders. It's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. And I'll guarantee you the days of Noah were probably just like the uh, days of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I've got a lot of playlists. You know, Why Does God Allow Evil, Matthew 24 Revealed. I go into a lot of detail on these, these same type of things. But, you know, Satan is... I don't know why the Lord's allowing Satan to exist. I don't understand it totally. I, I guess it's just for a testing. But, but let's go to Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, okay, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. All right, so let's face it. God says, don't do this. They didn't want God to listen to God. They did what they wanted to do. The Bible says, thou shalt not. The church of Satan says, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. In other words, do what you want to do. That shall be the whole of the law. Whatever you want to do, if it feels good, do it. You know, when Moses did all the miracles in front of uh, Pharaoh and all the miracles he did, the children of Israel, and, you know, went into the desert and everything, you know, the Lord wanted Moses to lead the people. Well, they didn't want Moses, and they didn't want the Lord. You know, let's face it. They wanted to, uh, you know, the Lord took them out of Egypt to try to take Egypt out of them. Egypt is not spoken of very highly in the Bible. But it didn't work. So they wandered for 40 years, and all the people that originally came out of Egypt all died in the desert. And it was the new generation that went into the Promised Land. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to read the book of Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus, for that matter. But turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 8, and verse 1. We'll start in verse 1. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, what's a judge? A judge is kind of like, a, he's a ruler, you know. He makes decisions. So if you've got two people that are fighting over a piece of property, and, uh, you know, they go before the judge, and the judge makes the ruling. Verse 2, Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beer, Sheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, bribes, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. So the sons were evil. They were taking bribes and... Whoever gave him the most money won the case. And all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel under Ramah, and said unto him, Pew, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations.
And but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, "Give us a king to judge us." And Samuel Samuel prayed unto the Lord. You'd think they would have said, "Get rid of those those perverted sons of yours that take filthy bribes. We hate we hate them." And don't think that Samuel didn't know what was going on with his children. I'm sure he did. I'm sure some people told Samuel what was going on. Sadly, sometimes people care more about their family than righteousness of the Lord. Although Samuel was a good man. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken, or listen, hearken, unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, they haven't rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, the people, the Lord's saying, oh, don't worry, Samuel, they, they didn't reject you. They've rejected me. They don't want me to be a king over them. You see, at this time, the Lord was their king. He was the ruler. He was the one leading the people. Verse 8. Well, let's see. <clears throat> For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which I have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day. Wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do they also unto thee. Does this sound like America? It's forsaken the God of the Bible, served other gods? Oh yeah. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the matter of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He's going to take your sons and draft them to go fight in the Middle East for the Antichrist. Oh, oh, wait, no. That's the, that's the Bob version of the Bible. Here, let me read the King James. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He shall take your sons and appoint them for himself for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. Now, chariots are for war. That's it. And he will appoint them captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Civil forfeiture people. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Doesn't that sound like what's going on today? But instead of a tenth, you know, if you added up all the taxes that you pay, I'll guarantee you it's over 50% of every penny you make. I remember when I was in college, I had a really good uh, accounting teacher. I liked him. And he held up a loaf of bread I've told this story before. He held up a loaf of bread. Back then, it was probably about $1.50 for a loaf of bread. And he says, oh, you see this loaf of bread? He says, there's over 100 different taxes on this loaf of bread. There's taxes on the land you grow it. There's taxes on the wheat. There's taxes on the miller. Taxes on the sugar. Taxes on the yeast that goes into it. Taxes on the, um, the, the packaging. Taxes on the trucks that haul it. And, I mean, he gave us a piece of paper that showed all the... Taxes on the diesel. I couldn't believe it. All the taxes. He's like, and he says, the farmer gets a nickel. On this loaf of bread that costs $1.50, the farmer makes a nickel. What's the other $1.45? He says it's taxes and uh, transportation 
and uh, you know uh, manufacturing and profits. Okay, First Samuel eight seventeen, he will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants, and ye shall cry out to me in that day because of the king which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Oh yeah? You don't want the Lord as a king? You want the other guy as a king? No problem. But don't come crying to me, baby. Uh-uh, because I ain't going to hear you. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Yes. And his name's going to be Apollyon and Abaddon. Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, because you don't want the Lord as your king. Yes, church people want a savior. They don't want to go to hell, but they don't want a king. And you know what? There's a difference between the sacrificial laws of blood sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, and there was a difference between the laws about how to run a government. Do you know that the Bible said that if somebody got caught stealing, they had to repay that person four times what they stole? Oh, yeah. If they didn't have the money, they had to be sold into slavery until they could pay. You know, the Bible says that a murderer should be put to death. Oh, yeah. Bible, The Bible did not want, the Lord did not want murderers out running around and murdering people, rapists, were to be put to death. And not easily, it was not easy to be put to death. The Lord said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. You had to have two or three witnesses to put somebody to death. And let me tell you something. If you committed perjury, which is lying under oath to have somebody convicted of a crime, nowadays, divorce court, women lie all the time. They commit perjury all the time. Never go to jail. Never go to jail. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to go to jail for perjury unless, of course, you make one of the elites mad. But if you committed perjury against somebody, let's say you got you and your buddy try to testify and say that, oh yeah, we saw the him, this guy kill somebody. If you got caught committing perjury and you tried to have them put to death for murder and they caught you, you were put to death. They killed you, the liar that was trying, the same penalty that, that you tried to pin on somebody else was put on you. Let me tell you what, people. If you knew for a fact that you were going to be killed for perjury, you would think not only twice, you'd probably think three or four times before you committed perjury. God's laws work. And you know what? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all these law schools, their original textbook was the Bible. Now they're a den of antichrist and thieves it's horrible i did a wedding for a, an attorney that went to harvard and i was talking to him about a lot of the stuff while we were waiting for the, the bride to show up he goes i didn't even know harvard was originally a bible college that's what harvard was it was a bible college and i even told him your law school the original textbook was the king james bible he didn't know it that's how much history we've lost 1 Samuel 8, 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, a wicked man, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken, or listen, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye, every man, unto his city. 
Well, who did they get? First, they had King Saul. Saul started off pretty decent, but he ended up pretty bad. You know, here it is. He was afraid to face Goliath. David went and faced Goliath and slew him. Did, did, did Saul a favor? And what ends up happening? Saul got jealous of David and wanted to kill him. You know, you kill the king, the king of Israel's enemy, and he, then he gets jealous and wants to kill you. I mean, Saul tried to kill King David. King David was okay. He was a good king in a lot of ways. He messed up with Bathsheba. But uh, the uh, thing is, his son Solomon, Solomon started off really good. But by the end of his reign, horrible. And then Solomon's son was even worse than Solomon. And in those days, Israel and Judah split. They were divided. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to read the Bible. It's important. And um, one of Israel's kings was Ahab. Oh, ho, ho, Ahab was bad news. Yeah, you want a king? You don't want the Lord as your king? How about 1 Kings, chapter 16, verse 33? And Ahab made a grove. That's witchcraft, people. When you go, when you when you have a grove of trees, you know they they say, oh, they're we're nature worshippers. Yeah, that's where they do their human sacrifices out in the woods, because they dare not ply their craft, their witchcraft, in the city. You know, because um, I wish I wish there were some righteous people that would see witches getting ready to sacrifice a baby on an altar to Satan and pull out their swords and cut their heads off. Something I got accused of just recently, but um, what can I tell you? The Lord's enemies are many. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. Anger. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Oh yeah, people. God was angry with Ahab. Ahab had a wife. Perhaps you've heard of her. Her name was Jezebel. Yeah, Ahab and Jezebel, wicked. I don't even know what Jezebel means. I'm afraid to ask, but I bet you it's not good. Jezebel means impure and wicked. That's what the actual meaning of the name is. Wow. All right, so Adam and Eve. Eve didn't want to listen to the Lord. She chose the serpent. People that were led out of Israel, uh, Egypt, Israel that was led out of Egypt under Moses, they didn't want Moses and the Lord. Those under Samuel, they didn't want the Lord as king. Starting to see a pattern, they didn't want the Lord as king. Now there was a king named Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Judah. And then you had Ahab, king of Israel. Yes, I know your church probably taught you that Jews and Israel is the same thing, but they're not. Israel was in the north, Judah was in the south. They had different kings, different land areas, different people. And Ahab's getting ready to go into battle against an enemy, and he's worried about losing. So he goes to King Jehoshaphat, and he asks them, he asks him, uh, can you help me out, you know? Uh, I'm getting ready to go to battle. Can you help me out here with some troops? 
And uh, Jehoshaphat, who was the good king, told Ahab, well, my people are your people. And, you know, sure, I can help you out. How many troops do you need? Well, Ahab was wicked. God hated Ahab, and Ahab hated God. So in 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, seer was a prophet, that's the, the old, an old name of a prophet. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said unto King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? In other words, what are you doing helping Ahab? Ahab's a, a wicked, evil SOB. What are you doing? And said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate the Lord? Should we love those people that hate the Lord? I'm not talking about people that just don't believe. I'm talking about people that actually hate the Lord. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath, wrath upon thee from before the Lord. You know, there's a big difference between just not believing in something and hating something. You know, there's a big difference. Um, I mean, you know, think about it. In John 15, 23, Jesus speaking, He that hateth me hateth my father also. And he's not talking about Joseph and Mary. Okay? He's talking about God the Father. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they had, have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So should we help people that hate Jesus Christ? There's a big difference between, well, you know, I, there was a time I'd have told you I didn't believe in Jesus. But I didn't hate Jesus. I didn't hate him. There's a big difference. And there's a group of people that actually hate Jesus Christ. That the church world absolutely falls over themselves supporting. Jesus speaking, John 15:18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Oh yeah. The world hates Jesus before it hated you. In Psalms 139 verse 22, King, I think it's King David, he says, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Now, Jesus told us to love our enemies, didn't he? But there's a big difference between our enemies, you know, we're to love our enemies. But we're not to, are we really supposed to love the Lord's enemies? Are you really supposed to love Satanists? I don't think so. King David said, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. And David was called a man after God's own heart. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 19.27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now this is going to be the future. Did you catch that? But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. See, Christ is not just a savior. He's a king. But people don't want Christ as king. They don't want Christ as king. They don't. I mean, they don't, period. In the book of Judges in 17... 
and verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So, you like your neighbor's wife? No problem. You just go next door and kill her husband. Take her. Do that which is right in your own eyes, right? That's what they did. Uh, Judges 21, 25. And in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in the, his own eyes. So... Let's read John 19. John 19. Anybody that tells you that the Romans uh, killed Jesus is a liar. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Scourge means whipped. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him, and they put on him a purple robe. Purple was the color of royalty. If you got caught with a purple robe in certain European countries in the Middle Ages, they would have killed you because it was reserved only for the royalty. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. In other words, they're smacking him around. Pilate therefore went again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. He's not guilty of anything. Verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, these are not Catholic priests, when the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews, the Jews, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard the saying, he was the more afraid. Pilate, an unsaved Roman that knew nothing, was afraid. He had the fear of God. Not the Jews. Verse 9. When Pilate therefore heard the saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? In other words, what's going on here? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Oh yeah, the Jews that delivered Jesus unto Pilate, they have the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Oh yeah, the Romans wanted to crucify Jesus, right? And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, but the Jews cried out, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Well, Caesar was the supreme king over all of Rome, all the, all the Roman empires. They're saying, if you let this guy go, we're going to go to Caesar and say that you, Christ says that he is a king and you let him go. It was treason against Rome. Pilate knew he'd be put to death. He knew that. Verse 13, 
When Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gab, Gabatha. Now these Hebrew roots people were going to tell you right here. Oh, well, the New Testament was written in Hebrew and then mistranslated into Greek. Then why does it say, but in the Hebrew, Gabatha? Because it was written in Greek, and they're telling you what it means in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. But in the Hebrew, Gabatha. And it was a preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Okay? And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Ooh, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, we don't want Jesus as our king. Uh-uh, forget that. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. There's an alternate, uh, alternate version of this in Matthew 27, verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? No, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Now, Barabbas was a murderer and a thief. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted a murderer and a thief. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither are the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but, but that rather a tumult was made, in other words, almost a riot, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Sounds like Pilate did everything he could to release Jesus, doesn't it? We have no king but Caesar. In Revelation 17 and verse 14, These, the wicked, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. You see, when Jesus came to be sacrificed he, on the cross, he came as a lamb. But when he comes back, he ain't going to be no lamb. He's coming back as a lion. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. People, those in Christ are called and chosen and faithful. I strongly believe Christians are God's chosen people. And I've been called racist and uh, white supremacist and all kinds of nasty things. But you know what? Let's face it. I think Christians are God's chosen people. I don't make any apologies for that. Turn to Galatians 3 and verse 26. For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when people tell you they're Abraham's seed and they don't believe in Jesus, they got a problem. There's only one way to God the Father. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. Did you know, did you know Peter was a, a southerner? Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, not Yeshua, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ, not Yeshua. Don't be surprised if Yeshua is the name of the Antichrist. And don't be surprised if the, the false prophet calls himself Elijah. Don't be surprised if there's two Elijahs. Don't be surprised. There's going to be a, maybe a fake one and a, and a real one. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Thessalonians was a, Thessalonica was a church, uh, a city that had a church in Greece. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Tribulations trouble people. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Boy, you'll never hear this read in, um, TBN, on TBN, huh? Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to, the, to them that trouble you. In other words, God's going to pay him back. Recompense. That means, oh yeah, he's going to repay. He's going to give them trouble for what they made problems for you. He's going to pay him back. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Wherefore, we also pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, people don't want Christ as king. They're, they want another king. They didn't want Christ. They wanted Barabbas, a, a murderer and a thief, because he was one of them. 
I, I will guarantee you, Jesus never broke any of the laws. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't a talebearer. He didn't never stole anything from anybody. And yet they wanted Barabbas. They wanted one of their own. So it's going to be in the end times. People don't want Christ as king. They're going to want the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And Jesus warned, the beast comes first. The Antichrist comes first. The false Christ comes first. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to fall. They've been taught garbage garbage in the churches garbage you turn on tbn they're always talking about it. send us a donation god will bless you where's that in the bible you know the tithe was supposed to go to god but there's nothing in the new testament about tithing nothing offerings yes but nothing about tithing Stay close, people, to, to Jesus, I think. Honestly, I think in the next 20 years, they'll, they're going to put Christians to death. Maybe less. I don't know. It's just the um, downward slope to hell. The countries, I mean, not just Europe, but the United States, and, and it's just amazing. I mean, I grew up, well, I was a child, a very small child during the, um, the 60s. You know, drugs, free love. I pretty much considered myself as having grown up in the 70s, which was basically a continuation of the 60s. And um, things have just gotten... I, I just... It, some of the things that are going on now, I just... I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, totally amazed. So, wouldn't surprise me. Well, that's why the Lord's going to allow the New World Order. People don't want Christ. They don't want to listen to Christ as king. So, he's going to let them have the other king, the one that they want. And it's going to look like it's working out for a while. But there's going to be a bunch of ecological disasters as laid out in the book of Revelation. And the Antichrist, the beast, whatever you want to call him, the man of sin, the son of perdition, he's going to blame that on the people. He's going to say, well, I destroyed this because you guys are evil. But it's going to, it's going to, you know, he's not going to be able to... Uh, He's not going to be able to save the planet. And people eventually are going to wake up. Some. A remnant. So, you know, the best thing we can do is um, give our testimony. In the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 9, Jesus speaking. This is the best advice in the world. But take heed to yourselves. For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues, who hangs out in the synagogues? For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues, ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, Take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. In other words, don't think about what you're going to say. Neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever ye shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's going to speak through you. Don't think about what you're going to say. Keep your mind blank. God, the Holy Spirit, will know exactly what to say. And you know what? That's going to be your proof of salvation. 
Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father of the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. There you have it, people. I'm telling you, persecution's coming. It's coming. It's Christians were, uh, Jesus said, we were to be the salt of the earth. And if the salt had lost its savor or its flavor, it was good for nothing but to be cast down to the ground and to be walked on under the foot of men. That's a paraphrase, but basically that's what the church is. It's good for nothing. And it's going to be trodden under the foot of man. It's already happening so all right well this is the end of uh, why God allows the new world order in a nutshell they don't want Christ as king they want the other guy God's gonna let them have the Messiah that they want the beast and I'll guarantee you a great numbers of people that attend church are going to turn their backs. They're going to be your enemies. They're going to betray you. They're going to have you put to death. It's coming. Well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker. I'm um, going to probably be offline for a little while until I get uh, relocated and uh, figure out what I'm doing. Um, All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is Christ, in his precious name. Amen.